Hello everyone, I am Mia, I am from the Global Forecasting School and I am an economist at the Central Bank of Armenia. I know you are probably used to seeing economists in blazers and more often than not, you expect them to be men. However, I want to point out that along with my colleagues, Satanik and Silvi, we are currently attending the GFS bootcamp in Portugal. Here we are working on the uh, Armenian economy, preparing for further production rounds and also examining the global economy among other things. Today I have some interesting topics to discuss. So let's dive into the role of women in economics, as well as the importance of dynamic learning environment in our lives. And I'll also touch up uh, on our upcoming seminar, which will take place on Tuesday with Charles Goodhart. So let's get started. In the Global Forecasting School, as I mentioned, we have a dynamic learning environment. You may wonder why we emphasize this term. You can find more about it in our papers and on the Better Policy Project's website. But in short, the productivity achieved in this dynamic learning environment is estimated to be 2-10 times higher than that of traditional central banks. Despite this high productivity, we also focus on maintaining a healthy work-life balance and minimizing overtime. As the team progresses, responsibilities are gradually delegated to students and working papers are issued according to schedule. The development of the FPAS Mark II and the implementation of a dynamic learning environment have been fascinating for Douglas Luxon and the team. This process has been documented in a series of working papers that describe the team's journey and how synergies were leveraged to increase productivity by 210 times. As teams learn from each other, productivity continues to grow over time. The progress is designed with a constant influx of new participants while others leave, ensuring that progress is sustained. Those who live often find attractive job opportunities thanks to the training they have received. Our commitment to work-life balance is not just about managing time but also about addressing gender bias. We value smart, critical and analytical thinkers in our dynamic learning environment. We frequently rotate roles and gender doesn't matter to us. In fact, we may be slightly biased in favor of women maybe and our department currently has more women than men and many of whom have children under age of two, including myself. I brought my two years old daughter to this bootcamp in Portugal for the second time. And the first time I came, she was just one year old uh, and couldn't walk yet. She learned to walk here and we managed to work, learn from each other with the team members and look after our youngest JFS student at the same time. Interestingly, I've noticed that Finland, the world's happiest country, has a woman-led coalition government, with 12 out of 19 cabinet members being women. This highlights how gender diversity can be a real asset. In my opinion, institutions that fail to embrace diversity may limit their potential for growth. After implementing this dynamic learning environment and developing the FPAS Mark II, we gathered feedback from a wide range of experts. We also received weekly guidance from senior advisors who are highly respected in their fields and have extensive experience in policy-making institutions. This includes Larry Summers, Morris Opsfield, uh, um, Larry Shambri, Robert Ford, Hamid Farouk and others. These advisors engage directly with our students, ensuring the highest standards through, through, through daily testing. In addition, students receive training and coaching while collaborating on various projects, all of which require thorough documentation, which we refer to as the HEAT reporting system. As I mentioned, we hold weekly seminars. Our next seminar, known as a Good Heart Hour, will take place on Tuesday featuring Charles Goodhart. In this session, we'll have an engaging discussion. Charles Goodhart recently emailed Doug, expressing his thoughts on Isabel Schnabel's recent speech. He noted that he had reviewed the speech and found it to be brilliant. 
He also mentioned that the topics covered in Schnabel's speech would be perfect for a seminar at the Better Policy Project. You can find more details about this on YouTube channel or website as well as recordings of previous seminars with Kuthart. This serves as a brief summary of major issues, particularly reflecting the key challenges faced by central banks like the ECB and Fed in today's uncertain economic environment. Isabel Schnabel's speech was particularly interesting because she emphasizes the importance of scenario analysis and preparing to act under different circumstances. It's important to note that the ECB hasn't yet adopted the core principles essential for central banks, such as the FPAS Mark I and FPAS Mark II models. I think it would be great if the ECB adopted the FPAS Mark II framework, which retains the most important aspects of Mark I, especially the three essential components, and removes outdated elements that aren't suitable for today's uncertain world. One outdated component is the reliance on baseline scenarios. Since the COVID-19 period, we have learned that baseline scenarios can give the market false assurance and mislead inflation expectations, ultimately decreasing the central bank's credibility. If you look at the historical rolling forecasts or spaghetti charts from central banks around the world, including ECB, Czech National Bank, New Zealand, Sweden, and even Armenia, you will see that baseline projections rarely materialize. That's why in our new framework, we don't claim to be expert predictors. Instead, we acknowledge that the future is uncertain. We account for all current economic shocks, risks, and factors, and we focus on achieving our central bank's main goal, which are price stability and financial stability. This flexible framework has been applied effectively in both Armenia, where we have a board decision-making structure, and Georgia, where a single governor makes decisions. Again, I want to mention that this framework is very flexible. Our framework contains all the tools and strategies needed to respond to risks and act in an uncertain environment, making it a holistic approach that promotes the least regret policy. To illustrate this, I like to use an analogy involving the road to Dilijan. Dilijan is a city in Armenia located in the mountains, where about 80% of the year is foggy due to the surrounding forests. When you drive to Dilijan, you often can't see what's ahead of you. However, you know that veering too far left will cause you to fall into the valley, while going too far right will lead you to crash into the mountain. The least regret option in this case is to stay closer to the mountain as the risks and damage are much lower than falling into the valley. Similarly, in policy decisions, we aim to choose scenarios that minimize the risks and costs associated with undesirable outcomes. That's all for now. Don't forget to check out our YouTube videos and I hope to see you in our seminar on Tuesday.